Hello, today we're going to be discussing force. So far we've looked at one dimensional motion and two dimensional motion, and those concepts do not include this idea of mass. However, today when we begin to discussing force, mass will become an issue for us. Alright, a force is defined as any action that causes an acceleration. Okay? If you think back to when we discussed acceleration previously, acceleration occurs when an object speeds up, slows down, or changes direction. Force is once again a vector quantity, okay, so remember the importance of vectors. Direction matters, so if we have forces that are in opposite directions, we're going to represent those directions with opposite signs, so don't forget about that idea. Now remember when we talked about two-dimensional motion, we had to break apart those 2D vectors into two 1D vectors in order to analyze them, and we're going to do the same thing for force. If we have a two-dimensional vector, we're going to break it into its components. Remember how we did that using sine and cosine with the angles that we were given. Okay? Our equation for force is F equals MA. All right? and this comes from Newton's second law of motion, which says that acceleration is directly related to force and inversely related to mass. So when Newton wrote this in his work, The Principia, he said that A equals F over M. But because we like to write things on one line, it looks prettier in books and on our notes, we just write it as F equals M times A, okay? It's where force equals mass times acceleration, okay? And really, this should be net force equals mass times acceleration, okay? Net just means total or sum of the forces, and we'll look at how we're going to represent that here in just a second. Okay, when we are looking at force problems, we're going to be looking at free body diagrams and summation equations. A free body diagram is just a visual representation of the forces that act on an object. And all it is is a box with force vectors drawn upon it. As we go through our examples of forces today, I will draw the free body diagram that would correspond to those different forces to get you a better idea of what they are. We also use what are called summation equations, and those are the vector addition of the forces acting on an object. Okay, so we're going to use the Greek letter sigma to represent the sum of it. You've probably seen that in math before. So we're going to say the sum of the forces in the x direction, and we're going to say the sum of the forces that act on an object in the y direction. Okay, a lot of times it will be just x or y, but if it's a two-dimensional problem, you need to sum up the forces in both directions. And we'll look at that again later on as well. All right, so free body diagrams and summation equations are ways that allow us to simplify our problems, keep our thoughts organized on paper, and be able to better analyze force problems. All right, so let's look at some examples of forces. The first one is the force of gravity. Force of gravity always acts on every object all the time, straight down to the center of the Earth. We also call force of gravity weight. Okay, so we talk about an object's weight, we are not talking about its mass. Okay, weight does not equal mass. Okay, those two terms are not interchangeable. Weight of an object is equal to the object's mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So on Earth, our acceleration to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. So when we say Fg equals Mg, we're talking about for the Earth. All right? If you're on a different object, or a different planet, I should say, then the G would be replaced by whatever the acceleration due to gravity is on that planet. We want to draw the free body diagram of the force of gravity acting on an object. Say we have an object that's in free fall. Okay? No other force is acting on it. It's falling down straight to the center of the Earth. We would draw our object. Okay, we draw the box no matter what it is. And we're going to draw a vector that represents the force of gravity. And then we want to label that vector. Okay? So the line shows you the direction that the force is acting, and the label tells you what the force is. Okay, make sure that you show the label in order to make sure that you understand what's going on. Because the next step would be to write the summation equation. If we don't label our forces, then it's hard for us to come up with the correct sign in our summation equation. Our second force we're going to look at is an applied force. An applied force is just any outside push or pull on an object. If we were to draw a free body diagram of an applied force, okay, say an object is being pushed, Okay, we can say F, A, okay? And the applied force, like I said, any outside push or pull, 
we just say FA is a general term, okay? We show the vector for the direction. You could draw the, direct, the vector going from the center to the right, or if it's being pushed from behind, if it's easier for you to remember this, you can draw it like that, okay? Either way, it doesn't make any difference at all. Don't forget that gravity is also present, so we want to draw that vector as well. Okay, so this will be an example of an object being pushed. Okay, so we have two different forces acting on it, and they're perpendicular to each other, so they have no impact on one another. All right, a third force we're looking at is something called the normal force. And normal doesn't mean just ordinary or mundane or routine. It means perpendicular, okay? The normal force is the amount of an object's weight that a surface supports that should be perpendicularly. So we need to change that. Okay, there is no specific equation for the normal force. It just depends on how the surface is oriented, if an object is being pushed up or pulled down otherwise. Okay, so if we draw or continue our free body diagram from the last problem, we could draw a surface, and so my orange line represent my surface. My blue line represent maybe a sled or a box, okay, sitting on the surface. We have gravity acting down on it. Say it's being pushed to the left or the right. We can add that two and two. Okay, and the normal force is going to act straight up. In this case, if our object is not accelerating up or down, what do you think the normal force is going to be equal to? Exactly. In this case, the normal force equals the force of gravity. It balances out. And if you have you know a book sitting on your desk right now and you're not pushing down on the book or pulling up on the book, then it's normal force that the book that the desk supports your book with is equal to the object's weight. Okay, if we put the object on an incline though, you'll notice that the force of gravity still acts straight down, but our normal force now doesn't directly oppose it. Okay, and we'll look at this later on, but this is an example where Fn does not equal Fg. Okay, so you cannot just make that assumption every time that Fn does equal Fg. You have to analyze the problem see if the object is first on a horizontal surface, and secondly, if there are any other forces acting in the vertical direction. If the object is on a horizontal surface and there are no forces acting vertically otherwise, then Fn will equal Fg. However, if either one of those two conditions changes, meaning that the object is on an incline, like this one, or if the object is being pushed down or pulled up in any way, then Fn will not equal Fg. Okay, so normal force does not have an equation. You need to look at each problem individually and analyze to determine the normal force. The question is, what's the importance of the normal force? Well, normal force is used when we calculate friction. Okay, friction is a force that always opposes motion. It's based on the molecular interactions between two different surfaces. Um, friction opposes motion, or what I, I like to say potential motion. Okay. We have two kinds of motion, we have, or friction. We have static friction, and we have kinetic friction. The word static comes from the Latin word meaning to stand. So we have static friction. That means the object is still, quote unquote, standing, so it's not moving. And this will oppose motion before it begins. So if you take a, maybe, maybe you're trying to rearrange your bedroom, and you've got a dresser that's really heavy, and you push and push and push on that dresser, and it doesn't want to move. Okay, you're applying a force to it, but it's not moving. That's an example of static friction opposing that potential motion. Okay, kinetic friction, you know the word kinetic, you've seen that one before many times. That means moving, okay, so it's the friction that opposes motion when it goes on. Static friction is always greater than kinetic friction. So think about that idea. Whenever you've pushed a heavy box across the floor, it really takes a lot of force to get it moving, but once you get it going, you can kind of push it pretty easily. But that static frictional force, the thing that you had to use to get it moving, is greater than your kinetic friction. Our equation for frictional force is that FF equals mu times Fn. Well, Fn we just saw on the last slide. That's the normal force. So now the question is, what is mu? And mu is what we call the coefficient of friction. 
Okay, you've seen the Greek letter mu before when we talked about our metric prefixes. Okay, we used it before for micro, as in micrometers or microseconds. But in this case, it's a numerical value called the coefficient of friction. Okay, it can be less than one or greater than one. Many times they're less than one, but they can be greater than one. Um, it's unitless, and it's simply the ratio between the frictional force and the normal force. The coefficient of friction is different between any two surfaces. So that's a value that you could be given in a problem. That's a, pro a value that you may have to solve for. But notice that it is, there is an equation for friction. Okay, so FF equals mu FN, where mu is the coefficient of friction, and FN is the normal force. <clears throat> the last kind of force we're going to look at today is tension. And tension is a force within a rope or a string. It's a specific kind of applied force. And for our purposes, the tensional force will be uniform throughout a rope or string until there is a knot. Okay, so you can have different examples of where there is a knot, or we can have just an object that's hanging from a string. So like a, a tire swing. Okay, if you have a tire swing, you know gravity is going to be pulling it straight down, and it's being held up by a rope. Then the force of tension is going to hold it up. Okay, so you can make FT. You can use a capital T. A lot of times you'll see that as well to represent tension. So either way, however you want to do it. If we have a rope, if we have a knot instead, let's say we had one that was at different dimensions. Okay, so maybe it was said something that's being hung by two different ropes or strings. Okay, here we had a knot represented. We had you know, force of tension one going this way. We had force of tension two going this way. Okay, the force of tension in those two ropes is different. However, in the first example, right here where there's only one string, they would have been the same. Okay, So make sure you pay attention to that. Don't just make the assumption that the force of tension is uniform in every single problem. Okay, you have to, Again, analyze the situation, see what's going on, see what you can figure out about the problem. Alright, so these are just... Well, let's go to the next slide. Alright, that's the end of it. So I hope you enjoyed it. We'll look at a little more in depth about forces next time. But thank you for watching. Thanks.